Good evening. Um, very warm welcome to this sessional research event uh, on a stochastic implementation of the APC model for mortality projections by Richards, Kleinoff, Curry, and Ritchie. The APCI model is a new addition to the canon of mortality forecasting models. It was introduced by the CMI for parameterizing a deterministic targeting model, but this paper shows how the APCI model can be implemented as a fully stochastic model. We demonstrate a number of interesting features about the APCI model, including which parameters to smooth, how to fit the data, how the fit of data compares against some other models, and how the various models behave in value at risk calculations for solvency purposes. I'm pleased to say that three of the authors of the paper are present tonight. Stephen Richards will present the paper, and Ian Curry and Torsten Kleinoff are here to contribute to the discussion and respond to questions from the floor. Stephen Richards is the Managing Director of Longevitas, a software company specialising in actuarial tools for the management and of mortality and longevity risk. Stephen is an Honorary Research Fellow at the Department of Actuarial Mathematics and Statistics at Heriot Watt University, where he graduated with his PhD in 2012. His research interests are the application of stochastic methods to biometric risks held by insurance companies. Ian Curry worked for, worked for over 40 years in the Actuarial Mathematics and Statistics Department of Heriot Watt University, where he is now an Honorary Research Fellow. He is most proud of his discovery of generalized linear array models with its catchy acronym GLAM. He is the joint author, mainly with Stephen Richards, of various papers that have appeared in actuarial journals. Torsten Kleinhoff is Associate Professor at the Department of Actuarial Mathematics and Statistics at Heriot Watt University. He's an expert on statistics and statistical computing, holding a PhD in statistics from Humboldt University, Berlin. His current research interests are related to probabilistic models for human mortality. Now I'll invite Stephen to present the paper to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for coming along this evening. Um, as we've uh, already dis discussed, this is a paper about the stochastic implementation of the APCI model for mortality projections. Um, I'll do a little bit uh, on the, the contributors, um, the background as to why this paper actually came to be, um, a little bit of discussion about the structure of the APCI model and how it relates to some other models um, which are in common usage. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the interesting aspects of uh, how you go about fitting the likes of the APCI and uh, other related models. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the parameter estimates themselves. I'll talk um, specifically about smoothing, um, what to smooth, what not to smooth, um, and some interesting uh, recent research as to, which makes the smoothing of, of parameters actually that bit easier than in the past. Um, one of the things that's particularly relevant to uh, life insurance companies under Solvency 2 is how this kind of model um, behaves under a so-called value at risk uh, assessment of longevity trend risk. That's the, the one in 200 uh, scenarios for uh, Solvency 2. And then some conclusions. Um, there's actually an additional section on constraints, which I'm not going to cover in the main <coughs> of the talk. But if people um, want to delve into the, the, the nitty gritty about constraints, it's, it's an option there for us. So a little bit about the contributors. Um, this is a combination of uh, my own company, Longevitas, a uh, long-standing relationship with Harriet Watt University and uh, the Actuarial Research Centre, which is supporting Torsten and a number of other uh, research packages uh, at Harriet Watt University and elsewhere. Um, so the background. Um, the CMI released uh, a new projection spreadsheet. It's uh, the latest in a series of deterministic targeting spreadsheets uh, that the CMI makes available for actuaries for use uh, specifically with uh, annuitant mortality. Um, its latest uh, incarnation, CMI 2016, um, carried across much of the same ideas uh, in the past, but one important difference is that the calibration 
was done using this new APCI model, which the CMI uh, brought, uh, brought out in uh, two working papers uh, over the last few years. Um, and interested parties can see these, uh, both the working papers and the consultation papers. Um, but the interesting thing uh, tonight is that although the CMI intended the APCI model mainly for the calibration of the spreadsheet, even within the, uh, the working papers, the CMI acknowledged that it would be possible to turn the APCI model into a fully stochastic model. Um, so we took this as a, a suggestion for some research, so we did just that. We took the, the, the working paper, the APCI model, as published, and then we actually worked out how best to turn it into a fully stochastic model. Um, and in doing so, we uncovered what we think are one or two interesting aspects of the APCI model, which we'll uh, bring to your attention tonight. So the APCI model is structured um, on the, the screen there. So the log of the central rate of mortality is a term in age, alpha x, uh, a term beta x, which is, if you like, an age-related modulation of a deterministic trend uh, based on the, a linear um, trend, plus this kappa term, which is a period effect, plus this gamma term, which is a so-called cohort effect. Um, so that's the structure of the APCI model itself. Um, what we're going to do in the paper is compare it to uh, three other models which are related either directly or uh, perhaps indirectly in terms of, of similar structure. The first one is the very simple age period model, which says that the, the mortality experienced in any given year is simply an age component plus a, a calendar year period component. There's the age period cohort model, an extension, which says that the mortality in a given year is a combination of a pure age effect, a pure period effect, plus some so-called cohort effect, which is related to the year of birth. Third, we have the Lee Carter model, um, probably far and away the best known of all the stochastic models in the literature, dating back a quarter century now to 1992. And that says that the mortality in any given year is a pure age effect plus an age modulated period effect, the period effect being the kappa y and the beta x term being this age modulation which allows for the period effect to either be uh, larger or smaller um, depending on, on what year the, the lives are in that particular year of observation. And last of all, we've got the age period cohort improvements model, the APCI model, um, which looks in many ways quite similar to the three preceding models. But we'll look at this in more detail. So we've got the very, very simple age period model at the top. This isn't a model that would actually be used in practice for insurance work. It's far too simple, it's far too simplistic, and doesn't come anywhere near close to capturing some of the realities of the mortality dynamics. But we've included it here because it's an ancestor model of uh, some of the other models. So very specifically, if we took the age period cohort model, sorry, the age period model, and just added a so-called <coughs> cohort term in gamma, we would have uh, the rather well-known age period cohort model. Alternatively, if we took the age and period effect and just modulated the period effect by some age-related term beta, we would have the very well-known Lee Carter model. And how would this? Uh, how does the APCI model um, fit into this? Well. The age period cohort and the Lee Carter models are actually generalizations of the age period model, but the APCI model is not in itself a generalization of these, but it is related. So for example, if we started with the age period cohort model, we could add uh, a beta term, an age related modulation, and we could change the nature of what kappa represents and we would get the APCI model. Now this changing the nature of kappa um, is actually quite important. We'll see later on in the talk how although the, the terminology looks the same um, with both having a, a kappa and a gamma term, um, the two models are actually very different and the nature of kappa and gamma are actually also very, very different indeed. That's not necessarily obvious just from looking at the formulae on the board. Uh, that's why there's a dashed line rather than a, a solid line because the APCI model is not a, a straightforward generalization. Alternatively, if we took the rather famous Lee Carter model 
added a cohort term and then changed the nature of kappa, we could get to the APCI model. So it's not a generalization of these models, but there are some clear parallels and some possible relations between the models. So superficially, we could look at the APCI model as being either an age period cohort model with some Lee Carter-like beta term that had been added, or we could think of it as a Lee Carter model with an added cohort effect plus some other wrinkles. But in fact, that is too superficial because there are some very important differences about the APCI model. In the first, in the Lee Carter model, um, the change in mortality, the period related response uh, to mortality is actually age modulated through this beta term. And that's not the case for the APCI model. The kappa term applies without any kind of age modulation at all. And we'll see later that that actually has quite a big impact for insurers. And similarly, in the APCI model, it's only the expected change, this linear expected change that is actually age dependent um, because the kappa term is not modulated. Um, so it's uh, similar, but not that similar. Um, and in particular, if we actually look at the uh, age period cohort model, the nature of the kappa, its behavior, how it looks, and what it does and what it represents is actually quite different uh, between the APC and the APCI model. Um, and that's something that's not obvious from the maths, and indeed the names would lead you to conclude that the APCI model is a generalization of the APC model. But as we'll see shortly, uh, there's very, very different behavior in the two models. So although it's related, it's not a generalization of either. We'll talk a little about um, the fitting and constraints of these. All of these models, and this is common to a very large number of projection models, all of the models have a potentially infinite number of parameterizations. Um, we pick the age period model as a very simple example. So we remember the age period model just had two terms, age effect and period effect. What we could do is we could define a new age period model, A prime or alpha prime, and we could just add a constant new to each one of the, the alpha x terms, and we could deduct the same constant new from all the kappa terms, and then when we add alpha prime and kappa prime together, we have exactly the same fit. So there's a, an infinite number of possible values of new here, so there's actually an infinite number of possible parameterizations for the age period model. And the same applies to the Lee Carter and the other models. They have a potentially infinite number of parameterizations. To fix on a, on a particular parameterization, you need to impose what we call an identifiability constraint. Um, so we have to select these constraints to impose some kind of desired behavior as part of the fit. A crucial aspect is that these identifiability constraints will not change the fitted value of the force of mortality at any age or year. So the, the fit is invariant, um, but the parameters will obviously be different. Now, the choice that you as an analyst make for identifiability constraints is driven by what sort of interpretation you want to place on the parameters and how you might want to go about forecasting them. So this is a choice that the analyst actually makes, but it won't actually change the fit of the model. So we go back to the age period uh, model as an example. If we impose a constraint that the sum of the kappa values should be zero, this won't change the model fit, but it will uh, mean that the alpha parameters are very broadly the average of the log of the force of mortality at each age across all the periods. Um, so it doesn't change the fit, but by imposing this identifiability constraint, we will actually make the alpha parameters have a particular and useful interpretation that alpha x is just the log of the force of mortality at age x, or the average of the logs of the force of mortality. Um, so for our other models, um, for the age period model, we only need one identifiability constraint, and that will nail down all the parameters uniquely. For the Lee Carter model, we need two identifiability constraints. Um, there's actually a choice. Um, there's, there's quite a number of different constraint systems you could use for the Lee Carter model, but the commonest is Lee and Carter's original one. 
Um, as, with the Lee, as with the age period model, we uh, force the sum of the kappas to be zero to give this interpretation of alpha x. And additionally, uh, Lee and Carter suggested forcing the sum of the, the beta values to be one. For the age period cohort model, again, we force the sum of the kappa terms to be zero, which gives us this uh, handy interpretation of the alpha x terms. And additionally, we force the sum of the cohort terms to be zero, and we also force this um, linear adjusted uh, or linear weighted sum of the cohort terms to be zero. Um, this very last constraint that comes from Cairns uh, et al. 2009, where they wanted the cohort uh, terms to not only have a mean of zero, but also to not have any linear trend for forecasting. Um, the APCI model needs uh, more constraints than this. In fact, it needs five. Um, again, we have the sum of the kappa terms uh, being zero, so we have this interpretation of alpha x. And then we have some additional terms. We have also the sorry, additional constraints. We have, again, the sum of the cohort terms should be zero. Uh, and then we also have this um, constraint that there should be no linear trend and that there should be no uh, quadratic shape to the, the gamma terms. It's worth noting that this is actually one of a number of uh, subtle but important differences between how we fitted the APCI model and how the CMI did it. Um, in the CMI's working paper, they uh, enforced that the sum of the cohort terms should just be zero. Um, but that actually has the drawback that a cohort with only one observation has the same weight in the calculation as a cohort with 30 observations. Um, now, that doesn't strike us as being particularly good because obviously the cohorts at the edges with few observations have far greater uncertainty. Um, so what we do is we follow the, the uh, proposal from Cairns et al. in 2009. It's a paper in the North American Actuarial Journal, a very well-known one. And what they did was they said that actually the sum of the cohort terms should weight according to the number of times the cohort term actually appears in the data. So if a cohort has 30 observations, it has a, a, a WC, a weight value of 30. But if a cohort term only has five observations, it only gets a weighting of five. And this way, the cohorts at the edges with few observations get uh, correspondingly less weight in the calculation. Um, so we think that this is a preferable approach to dealing with cohort terms, so we've adopted this. Um, there's more details on this approach in weighting cohorts uh, at the back of the, the paper in Appendix C. So um, looking at the age period, age period cohort and the APCI models, they're all linear. Um, they all use identifiability constraints, uh, or they all need identifiability constraints if you want to folk, uh, nail down a particular parameterization. And they all potentially have parameters that could be smoothed. Um, and what we do in our models, uh, similar to the CMI, we assume that in the two-dimensional grid, uh, we've got deaths and exposures at each age in each calendar year, and we assume that the number of deaths observed is a Poisson distribution with a mean, which is just the product of the exposure, mid-year exposure, and the force of mortality. Uh, so it's the mid-year um, expected number of deaths uh, there. Now, we can fit the age period APC and APCI models as penalized smooth GLMs. These are linear models, so they can actually be fitted as GLMs. Um, and actually, as Ian covered in one of his earlier papers, you can also fit the Lee-Carter model as a GLM, but you have to do it as a, a pairwise step conditional on one of the parameter sets. Um, now, this is an important, another important difference uh, between how we fitted our models and the, the CMI fitted theirs. Um, Ian published a paper in the Scandinavian Actuarial Journal in 2013, um, which I think is actually far more significant than has yet been realized. Um, at the core of uh, the generalized linear model, there's what's called the iterative uh, reweighted least squares algorithm, which is a, a very powerful means of quickly fitting a generalized linear model in such a way that it uh, allows for quite a wide variety of uh, distributions, but also for a wide variety of link functions. Uh, what Ian did in his 2013 paper is actually something really very impressive indeed. He has extended the GLM fitting algorithm so that it will not only maximize the likelihood, as it does with the, the original 
uh, Neldorn-Wedderburn algorithm, but he's actually extended the algorithm so that it will also simultaneously maximize the likelihood while also applying your choice of any linear identifiability constraints that you may wish to actually apply, while also smoothing the parameters that you have chosen to smooth. So you get everything in one. The model will fit, the constraints will be applied, and the parameters that you want to be smoothed will all be smoothed all in one. Okay, so it's a, you might call it an integrated uh, process. And this is in contrast to the CMI's approach where the actual uh, maximization of the likelihood or the penalized likelihood is one stage and there's a separate smoothing stage added on and then there's a separate uh, uh, constraint application stage. Uh, one of the incredible things about Ian's algorithm, it does all these things things in one integrated algorithm. It's relatively straightforward to implement in programming terms. I strongly commend it to you. Uh, and it's, uh, the details are in his 2013 <coughs> paper. But the great thing is that you can actually do an awful lot in terms of uh, model fitting, um, smoothing of the parameters you want to smooth, and applying the constraints all in one. It's a very, very powerful tool to use, and I, I cannot recommend it strongly enough for your model fittings. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, but I'm a big fan of this particular algorithm. I think it's a, a big deal, um, and I think it will actually have a lot more application in the future. One point to note um, is that identifiability constraints don't always have to be linear. So for example, in the Lee Carter model, both Jerosi and King and Ian and I presented non-linear identifiability constraints to the Lee Carter model. Um, Cairns et al. used uh, some nonlinear identifiability constraints as well. Um, however, proving that an identifiability constraint is a constraint is actually a lot harder if it's not linear. It's a lot easier if it's a linear constraint. And the, the Curry algorithm uh, will actually only work with linear constraints. Uh, but that's not too much of a constraint. Uh -huh. Right, on to parameter estimates. So. Um, we fit our models uh, either as uh, these uh, the three, the AP, APC and APCI models, as either straightforward linear models, generalized linear models, or the, the Lee Carter model with this kind of um, conditional two-step. And this is the, what we get for the alpha hat estimates for the four uh, models. Unsurprisingly, they look almost identical, and that's because um, they are basically doing the same job in each case. Alpha x here is essentially approximately the, the log of the average force of mortality uh, at a given age across the entire period here. Um, so alpha x plays the same role, um, average log mortality by age, as long as we apply this identifiability constraint that the sum of the kappa value should be zero, then alpha x will have this interpretation. Um, it's worth noting that Although we've actually used a single parameter for every single age here, that's far more parameters than we strictly need. That's a clearly over-parameterized part of all of the models. Um, these 50 plus parameters uh, are strictly speaking unnecessary. There's a very clear, smooth pattern there. So these 50 plus parameters could be uh, replaced by a much simpler, smoother curve. Um, what we could do then is we could actually um, reduce the, what's called the effective dimension of the model by replacing these independent alpha x parameters with some kind of smooth curve. Um, and as you can probably see from the previous slide, it wouldn't actually change the, the model in any material way. The, the beta parameters for the Lee Carter model and the APCI model, at first glance they look uh, quite different, but in fact um, if you actually plot minus beta for the APCI model, you can see that actually the beta parameters in the Lee Carter and the APCI model are actually doing uh, strongly similar jobs. This um, age modulated, uh, or this age modulation, if you like, of uh, the, the period effect in the case of the Lee Carter model or the linear trend in the APCI model. And again, looking at that, uh, it's a more complex shape than it is for uh, alpha x, but it's actually still a, an over-parameterization, if you like, we don't need all of these beta parameters, we could replace them with a smooth curve and not actually make any uh, material change to the model. Um, so beta x, it plays an analogous role in both Lee Carter and APCI models. 
um, although the, the beta X in the APCI model only operates on this linear trend term, um, we would note that actually we think that to make the beta uh, term in the APCI model more directly comparable with the Lee Carter beta, it would have been better multiplied by Y bar minus Y rather than Y minus Y bar, but we've stuck with the, uh, the parameterization of the CMI actually used. Um, and like alpha, the beta X could be usefully um, replaced with some kind of smooth curve to reduce the effective dimension of the model. But one important aspect is that smoothing the beta X actually improves the forecasting uh, behavior of the model. Um, there's a paper from Del Ward, Denwee, and Eilers, um, which actually shows that smoothing the, the beta X terms in the Lee Carter model helps reduce the risk that the projections at adjacent ages cross over in the future. So you would smooth beta X not just to reduce the dimension of the model, but uh, it's important to smooth it to improve the forecasting properties as well. Um, we note as an aside that the APCI model actually has two uh, time varying components. It has this age dependent linear trend, and it has, which is modulated by beta X, and it also has an unmodulated uh, period effect, kappa Y. Um, so to conclude, the alpha X and beta X terms seem to play very similar roles across the models where they're present. But what about kappa Y and the cohort terms? Um, so here are the kappa Y parameters, or the kappa Y estimates for the four models. We can see that for the age period, age period cohort and Lee Carter models, kappa plays a very similar role. Um, not quite the same values, but certainly the same behavior, the same pattern, um, the same trend, and it would be the same methods you would use for forecasting uh, in these three cases. We can see here, though, that kappa and the APCI model has a very, very different uh, nature, very different behavior, um, much less obvious any kind of trend, much harder to forecast as, as a result, because there's much less of any kind of clear signal uh, going on here. Um, so we can say that while alpha and beta play uh, very similar roles across all models, kappa Y only plays a similar role for the first three. It actually plays a very different role in the age period cohort model, or sorry, the APCI model. Um, and partly as a result of this, the, the kappa values in the APCI model, they've got much less of any kind of clear trend or a, a clear pattern um, when it came to forecasting. Um, and as we'll see, the, the actual kappa values in the APCI model are very heavily influenced by other structural choices um, that uh, you make when fitting the APCI model. We turn our attention to the cohort term, gamma y minus x. Um, we can see here that it's actually very different patterns uh, under the traditional age period cohort model and the, the APCI model. Radically different uh, patterns coming out here. And this is in part because of different constraints that are applied. Um, the APC model um, has, oh, sorry, the APCI model actually has an additional constraint, this quadratic uh, constraint, which the APC model doesn't have. And this has radically changed uh, the, the structure and the shape of these gamma terms. Um, well, this leads to an interesting question. The gamma terms appear to play directly analogous roles in the two models they look as though they're actually uh, cohort terms or represent cohort effects. But the values taken in the two models are, com are very different and the shape displayed are very, very different. If you take a given year of birth, the two models have very different ideas as to what the gamma term is. So if the shapes of these gamma terms and their values are so different between the two models, what do they represent? Can they represent a cohort effect at all if two different models actually have very different idea of what the so-called cohort effect should be. And it turns out that the gamma terms, although they look like cohort effects, they don't actually have an interpretation that's independent of the model. As Ian said, they don't actually have a life of their own. They only actually have a life and interpretation with respect to the structure of the model that they were fitted with and with respect to the other parameters and the constraints. So the gamma terms are not actually, uh, if you like, independent cohort effects or any kind of independent estimate of the so-called cohort effect. 
So in conclusion here, we don't think that the gamma terms describe uh, a cohort effect outside of the models. We don't think that they represent a cohort effect in any meaningful way. Smoothing. Now, the CMI, when they presented the, the APCI <coughs> model, they smoothed all the parameters, the alpha, the beta, the kappa, and the gamma. Um, but as we've seen, only the alpha and the beta terms exhibit sufficient regular behavior that means they can be smoothed without actually making any material impact in the model. Um, we are asked the question, does it make sense to smooth the kappa terms or the gamma terms in the APCI model? We don't think it makes sense to smooth either of them because they don't actually exhibit smooth regular behavior. Um, now in, in the CMI's own model, it actually has a smoothing parameter for kappa called S kappa. There are corresponding S values for alpha, uh, beta, and, and gamma. And when maximizing the likelihoods, it, the CMI maximizes a penalized likelihood in the same way that, that, that we do here. And it has the smoothing penalty for kappa based on the second differences, and it multiplies this by this uh, 10 to the power uh, SK term. So it's actually applying this fairly heavy smoothing um, for kappa. Um, and the value for S kappa is set subjectively, and the CMI state this in uh, their working paper, that it's up to the analyst to decide what value to pick for S kappa. They present the results of uh, picking a couple of different values. Um, but what is the impact of smoothing kappa if, as far as we are concerned, it ought not to be smoothed? Um, well, to quote from the CMI's uh, working paper, that the life expectancies produced by the APCI model are rather sensitive to the choice that the analyst makes for this S kappa term, with the impact varying quite widely across the age range, um, with a particularly large impact at uh, ages above 45. Um, now, S kappa has a, a large impact uh, in part because, as we saw earlier, the kappa terms um, don't have any particularly strong pattern. They don't have any particularly obvious trends that one could extrapolate or forecast. Um, and in fact, the kappa term in the APCI model, really it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of like a, a leftover collection of other aspects of the model. That's why the values are relatively small, and that's why they, they don't show uh, any particularly clear behavior. Um, I'm not trying to be rude. I don't want to call it a residual because a residual has a clear meaning in, in uh, statistics. Um, but if, if kappa is kind of like the leftover of other aspects of the model and it's not applied with any kind of age modulation, should you be smoothing it at all? Because if you smooth something that's essentially a leftover that's very sensitive to other structural choices made in the model, then you're going to get some quite radical changes in direction if you try and forecast this, uh, this smoothed entity. And this is one reason why the life expectancies in the, the CMI's working paper proved to be so sensitive to the choice of uh, S kappa, the smoothing parameter. So we'll turn our attention now to some value at risk considerations. Um, one of the interesting things about longevity trend risk is it obviously unfolds over several decades over the lifetime um, remaining lifetime of your annuitants, um, but it's a requirement of our regulation that we should look at all risks, particularly uh, in, including longevity trend risk, through this one-year value risk style prism. So what we did with the APCI model and the others is we took the uh, approach that we set out in our paper of 2012, um, where we take a model we use it to simulate the following year's mortality experience. We add this pseudo experience to the data, refit the model, and then look at the, the forecast that comes out of it, value the liabilities um, under this forecast, and then repeat 1,000 times, 5,000 times, however many times you want. And this will actually give us um, a density, a uh, distribution, if you like, of the liabilities under this value at risk, uh, one year value at risk assessment. Uh, here's an example from the paper. This is from a Lee Carter model, and this gives you an idea of the, the different forecast rates, mortality rates, age 70, that come out of this kind of value at risk process just from simulating and refitting the, the model. But you can see you've got different forecasts, and this will obviously result in different uh, reserve values. 
Um, what we're using here for the APCI model, um, for parameter uncertainty, we're using uh, an ARIMA model without a mean for all the gamma terms. We're using ARIMA models with means for kappa terms under the AP, APC, and Lee Carter models, because as we saw earlier, the kappa uh, process has a, a clear trend, a clear pattern. And we actually use an ARIMA model without a mean for kappa in the APCI model. And these are the densities, the value at risk densities that you get um, for male 70 year olds um, with uh, annuities. Um, and we can see here that each of the different models has got quite different looking density. Um, we can see some of the models actually um, are broadly unimodal. The age period and the, the Lee Carter models are unimodal. But the age period cohorts and the APCI models are actually bimodal. Um, and this follows through into um, some of the, the conclusions you would draw from the, the value at risk assessment. The APCI model is particularly interesting because it's almost symmetric, bimodal and symmetric, um, where the, the median or the mean is actually not anywhere near likely to be the, one of the most commonly occurring values. And the, the value at risk, the 99 and a half uh, percentile is quite far from uh, the, the mean which is not the case for uh, some of the other models there. Um, very, very different picture for the, uh, the value at risk densities here for the, these four different models. Um, we also did similar calculations for some other models in the paper, but we won't cover those at the moment. So we've got a variety of density shapes, and uh, not all are unimodal. It is possible even just using a Lee Carter model, which in the previous slide was unimodal, it's still possible for some data sets to get bimodal distributions out for the value at risk calculations. Um, this is by no means a feature that's restricted to the APC and APCI models. Um, these value at risk calculations are, are not always unimodal. Um, and for me, the very different pictures uh, of these densities just emphasizes just how much variability there can be uh, between different models, even ones that seem to be uh, closely related. And for me, this emphasizes the overriding need to use several different models when you're looking at setting not just your uh, best estimate, but also when you're setting your uh, capital uh, values under the value at risk approach. Um, what we've got here is an, an almost final slide on the value at risk uh, percentages uh, for a variety of ages for the four models. And we can see uh, the four different models, despite having uh, relationships between them, paint very, very different pictures as to what the value at risk capital should be at each age. And for me, this just is a reminder as to why it's important to uh, look at uh, the outputs from many models when you're exercising your expert judgment. Um, one question which cropped up was why uh, do the capital requirements reduce with age for the Lee Carter model, but not for the APCI model? Um, and the answer is that this kappa term for the Lee Carter model, it's modulated by beta x, and beta x tends to be small and close to zero under the Lee Carter model for um, high ages. In the APCI model, it's uh, entirely unmodulated, and this leads to um, comparatively larger uh, impact at the older ages, which is one reason why the APCI model paints such a different picture of the capital requirements. So in conclusion, um, we think that the APCI model is implementable as a fully stochastic model, and not just for deterministic purposes. Um, we can see that the APCI model shares a number of features and also drawbacks with the age period APC and Lee Carter models. Um, we've seen here that smoothing the alpha and beta terms of the APCI model is sensible. It doesn't distort the model. And indeed, smoothing beta will improve some of the forecasting properties. Um, we don't think it's sensible to smooth either kappa or gamma in the APCI model. They're not well-behaved regular processes, <coughs> and smoothing them will, will lead to distortions. Um, and although he doesn't want it, another recommendation that the, the Curry algorithm, I, I encourage you to seek it out and implement it. It's particularly useful for uh, fitting these penalized smooth uh, GLMs. All right, and some references. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um,
Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now open the discussion to, to the floor. Um, please do feel free to, to contribute, whether you're a longevity practitioner or someone who is associated with the development of the APCI model or an academic with interest in stochastic mortality models or just somebody who's got a general interest in understanding longevity trends. Uh, I'd like to hear from a, a range of comments and a range of perspectives. Um, would anybody who um, thinks he or she may wish to contribute to the discussion please raise your hand now, please? Okay, so one or two people, but uh, not, not an absolute flood. So we, we probably do have plenty of time for the, the, the people who've expressed a, a, a desire to contribute. And also, if, if other people would like to contribute, then um, you'd be most welcome to. Um, if you have prepared detailed notes, please could you summarize the main points uh, verbally and provide the detail to the authors for future response after the meeting. Um, remember that the meeting is being recorded for publication in the British Actuarial Journal, so please wait for the microphone to be brought to you before you begin your contribution and make sure you speak into the microphone. Please clearly state your name before making your contribution so your contribution can be attributed accurately in the BAJ. Okay, uh, I think we have the first contribution there, please. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Gordon. I'm speaking on behalf of the Mortality Projections Committee of the CMI, of which I am the chair. So, uh, we are strongly in favor of debate that enhances general understanding of mortality modeling, and in particular, throws light on tools the CMI uses. So, we welcome the paper. Uh, we do, however, have some specific points to make. Um, first, the APCI model is used by the current CMI projections model, but it's important for readers of the paper who may link the conclusions of the paper to the validity of the, of the model, to understand that the CMI does not use the APCI model as a stochastic model. The APCI model is used solely to obtain initial improvement rates for projection split between age period and cohort-related improvements. The CMI model uses a different model from APCI to project future improvements, and in both cases we view the models as frameworks to help us derive the projections and not as the drivers of the projections. Um, I also have some uh, observations on the paper itself. Um, first, comparing kappa terms between the APCI model and the other models considered, as is done implicitly in figure four or on slide 41, uh, is potentially misleading. In the other models, the kappa term represents all period dependency, whereas the APCI model, this is represented by the kappa term plus the beta term times time, and it would have been more informative to have plotted this, I think. Um, second, the paper's conclusion states that the kappa term in the APCI model, which captures period variation over the average trend, does not look like a suitable term, a suitable candidate for smoothing. There is a danger that readers of the paper may therefore conclude that the CMI model is doing something wrong by smoothing the kappa term. Uh, so I'd like to point out that in the CMI model, we are specifically looking through to the underlying trend after discarding both the idiosyncratic and the systematic annual noise. And the smoothing approach used in the CMI model is mathematically identical. It's mathematically identical to modeling the kappa term as an ARIMA 020 process, i.e. it treats mortality improvements as a random walk, which given the menagerie of ARIMA models on display in Appendix E, is prima facie reasonable and in our view certainly fit for the purpose of deriving the initial improvement rates. Um, further, allowing users to select the underlying variability of that random walk via S kappa is a deliberate feature of the model that allows users to take a view on how much weight to place on recent changes in mortality improvements. Um, finally, the quadratic pattern of cohort dependence on year in the graphs of gamma in figures five and seven for the constrained and unconstrained APC model and in figure eight for the unconstrained, although not the constrained, APCI model we think should be a red light for the authors. We strongly suspect this feature is an artifact of how the models have been fitted. Uh, I refer to John Palin's paper, When is a Model, When is a Cohort, Not a Cohort, presented at the 2016 International Longevity and Mortality Symposium. This could easily be addressed by different constraints and or priors. So um, I'll conclude my remarks by saying thank you to the authors for an interesting and thought-provoking paper. And again, stressing that the CMI uh, welcomes debate. The more scrutiny of components of the CMI model, the more robust the model is likely to be. Thank you. Thank you. So plenty of points there. Um, 
Would any of the authors like to respond to any or all of them at this point? I didn't actually catch half of it, I'm afraid, so I, I think we'll just wait for the, the written um, transcript. Okay, is, is, was there any, any point that you would particularly like the authors to respond to right now? Uh, okay, so uh, I guess I'd like to, uh, there are two points, particular points. One is, so the equation that you put up for smoothing the kappa terms in the CMI model, that is mathematically the same as having an, a, a random walk for mortality improvements. So when you go on to fit ARIMA processes to the kappa term in the other models, the CMI model is implicitly already doing that in the calibration of the APCI model. Those smooth kappa terms are no different from the ARIMA process terms that you get for your kappa series. They're the same animal, in effect. So calling one smoothing and another ARIMA process is drawing an artificial distinction. And the CMI model is not designed to be projected as a, as a stochastic model. So in, 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 in other words, it's, it, so in our view, it is fit for purpose because we are trying to under, understand the underlying smooth process. So that's, that's the first point. And the second point is similarly, we think that, think, think that the quadratic pattern, the parabolic pattern to those cohort terms that you're getting from the other models does not pass muster from a common sense point of view. So those are the two points. One is, we're already, this, what you've called smoothing is no, nothing other than ARIMA 020. Mathematically, it's the same thing. Uh, fitted by maximum likelihood with a prior, it's the same thing. And the second is that we think the cohort pattern in the other models is unrealistic. So when you draw, you graph the constrained APCI model and note that the, um, there are probably better ways of achieving that, but we don't think the fact that it's constrained and has an overall flat cohort pattern is a bad thing. We think that that's a good thing. But I'm happy to wait for the response to the written one I can pick up on well. the last point. Um, it doesn't actually make, as you say, it doesn't make uh, too much of a difference um, which constraint system you actually choose. <coughs> um, and I agree, um, the purpose of the selection of which constraint system you want to use is to impose the behavior that you actually want on a particular set of parameters. So in the case of the APCI model, you have three constraints on the gamma terms, uh, one of which is, as you alluded to, is which is to remove the, any kind of quadratic uh, type behavior or, or particular shape. And it's perfectly valid to do this um, if, for example, you wanted to, say, uh, forecast the, the gamma terms um, for the, the unobserved cohorts. I don't have any problem with that. Um, I'm not quite sure I follow, uh, perhaps we need to spend some time uh, looking at it, not quite sure I followed the points about the Kappa process being an implied ARIMA uh, 020 uh, process. That's presumably one without a mean. Yes. Right. Okay, I would need to actually um, go away and actually have a look at that particular point. I'm not entirely convinced at the moment that they are completely identical, um, but I will take your comments away and go and study them. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Would anybody else like to, to comment or, or ask a question? I think we had one here. David? Okay, uh, <coughs> David Wilkie. Um, I, I, I'd like to, I wasn't going to say this, so I may as well take up the point about the um, time series modeling. Um, I've done a fair bit of time series modeling in different field, but um, I don't quite take, I understand Tim Gordon's point that the, uh, a, a deterministic smoothing can be the same or is the same as an ARIMA model. It, it may be in some circumstances. If you say the ARIMA model is just a random process. Each, each year is independent um, with some distribution. Then if you just put a straight line through the middle of it and say they're all equal to the mean, then you've got the same sort of smoothing. But if you think of the um, uh, an AR1 model where uh, with quite a high standard deviation, then um, it jiggles up and down around the mean, but it will go quite a long way up from the mean and then back down again and below the mean and back up again. 
and just substituting the mean all the way through uh, is giving not the same, not, not in, it's not giving the same forecast to the future because the future forecast for a time for an AR1 model depends on, on where you are this last year in the in, in year T or the, your final year. Um, it doesn't just depend on the average and you would go <coughs> gently, the forecast would move exponentially down towards the mean. And uh, I mean, those are the two simplest uh, models. Um, and I just don't quite see how they can be the same. Um, a quite separate point I was uh, going to make, uh, I think you've got, in, uh, not, it's not really, a, this is a, a very general point about stochastic modeling. I think you've got a fair amount of allowance for uncertainty in the parameters. Uh, is, that, is that right, that there's, there's an allowance for parameter uncertainty in it? Uh, you mean in the value at risk? In, yes, in the sim future simulations. Yes, there, there is an allowance for um, parameter risk, but for the value at risk calculations, uh, the real driver, or the, the majority driver, of the uncertainty actually comes from the one-year uncertainty. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I guess it would do. But <coughs> you also, um, when you've done the smoothing, uh, I mean, if you fit a, for the alpha term, you can fit a sort of Gomper straight line pretty well, but what's the slope of that? You're not sure of what it is. You're, you're pretty sure. There's very small um, error in it. But there is some uncertainty about that. With the time series modeling, there is some uncertainty about all the parameters you're getting in. And uh, I'm doing some work on a quite different field of investments um, where <coughs> I'm introducing <coughs> pardon me, what I would call a hypermodel, um, a, a new term, where at the beginning of each simulation, one simulates the parameters for that simulation from some distribution of the parameters, which I suppose is what you're doing as well, same sort of thing. And then you simulate uh, using the innovations that you're expecting to come in, in the time series modeling, um, according to the standard deviation you fitted, but the, not the standard deviation you fitted, the standard deviation simulated for that particular simulation. Now that means that, that you, you have uh, twice as many plus a covariance matrix of parameters, um, but you are allowing, I think, more reasonably for the uncertainty in your modeling because all, all your estimation is done over some finite time period. And uh, it's not much more than about 40 years for the time series modeling, which is pretty small. Um, so the standard errors of the parameter estimates have been reasonably large. And uh, a feature I think is uh, a good, I, mean, I think this is a good policy to use for any actuarial simulation in, in any field you like. But a feature about it is that when you're normally doing this sort of fixed parameter fitting, you're wanting a, a parsimonious model with as few parameters as you can get away with. And if, some, if one of the extra parameters in the time series model is marginal, or in correlation model, is marginally, um, might not quite be significant, you tend to miss it out. If you're wanting to allow, from an actuarial point of view, for the reasonable amount of uncertainty, you should possibly leave it in and be more generous rather than parsimonious. Now, from the point of view of value at risk, the finance director wants the lowest value you can find. And if you present him with 10 models, he'll choose the lowest, I suppose. But the prudent actuary should more or less be choosing the highest that you can find because that's the one where there is the most reasonable uncertainty. I don't think, I think, I don't, haven't done enough of this to know how to balance what is uh, a reasonable extra to put in or a skimped extra to put in, but I've been fitting, um, sort of in one context, straight distributions and skew distributions, 
with the same sort of parameter structure. And rather than putting the skewness coefficient as zero and saying it's fixed, it might be a bit different. I'm inclined to say, well, it might be different in the future for the investment models I'm looking at. So I'll allow for the, not, the un uncertainty of my skewness estimate, even though it's pretty close to zero. Uh, I don't think that's a, a general point that would be uh, useful to make, although the authors have any feeling about it. It's, it's quite a, on a totally general point about actuarial modeling. A final very small point that I make, and I'll actually make it in writing to the authors afterwards, is entirely to do with their choice of yield curve for the calculation of AXs. Um, with respect, uh, it's a bit like, uh, as far as people in, who are from the bond market are concerned, it's a bit like somebody doing a model for the bond market and not knowing the difference in his annuities between QXs and MUXs and MXs and thinking they're all the same. But I'll put that one in writing and miss that out from the recorded version of this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If you are a, a, a life office practitioner or a pensions consultant who, uh, who analyzes longevity and uses stochastic models as part of that analysis, I'd be very interested to hear whether you feel this is um, a, a material and a very useful contribution to the, to the array of stochastic models that you might use um, and, and how you think you might use it in the future. Um, particularly because um, obviously being slightly more generalist, uh, we don't fully understand all of the um, statistical nuances of all the models, but we try to use them as best we can to, to manage uh, longevity risk. Any, any thoughts on whether this um, APCI model will go into the pantheon of um, models that will be used by life officers and pensions consultants analyzing longevity? Uh, if I could just come back to uh, what Tim was talking about, uh, well, the life office people think <laughs> about their question. Um, one of the, the big problems in these kind of, of uh, models is the interpretation of parameters. And I think it's very easy to be misled here. If you take the age period uh, model, it's a simple model, we, we put a, a constraint on the, the time term, and lo and behold, it's quite obvious that the alpha terms are, correspond to overall mortality and uh, the, the kappa terms uh, refer to the general trend in, uh, in mortality over time. Uh, so one is perhaps encouraged to think that this uh, uh, would always be the case, whatever kind of model that you have. So if you then move to the age period cohort model uh, and you have these uh, cohort terms, now what you are certainly doing here is that in an overall sense, you are modeling the strength of the, the cohort to, uh, influence uh, on mortality. But what you're definitely not doing is being able to identify the individual gammas with particular cohort effects. And I, I think one is a bit misled by the success of this interpretation in the age period cohort, age period model, uh, to thinking that uh, that perhaps might extend uh, further down the line. There, the in the APC model, it is definitely the case that the constraints have a huge influence on the kind of values that you, you, will, you will get. And the, the constraint systems are, it's not obvious what the constraint system, system should be. And uh, very different values ca can result. So beware of over-interpretation of uh, gamma terms. <laughs> Any other comments? Um, not necessarily on whether we, we think we're going to use the APCI model um, alongside all the other ones. Any, any other comments? Um, one thing that I'd quite like to ask the, the authors was, um, I, I come across a, a number of circumstances where a model seems to fit the data very, very well, um, but doesn't necessarily produce plausible projections. Um, and I, but I don't see why there shouldn't be a sweet spot where there is a model which does, does both, um, and yet it seems to be quite elusive. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that there isn't really a trade-off between 
fitting data, the data very well or parsimoniously and producing good projections. It's just that um, it's, it's very hard to find. Um, it's certainly the case that goodness of fit to the data um, shouldn't be the sole criterion for judging the quality of a projection mm. model. Um, I think this in part came uh, through from the, the Cairns uh, et al. 2009 paper where they compared uh, eight different models, um, some of which, uh, to pick the Renshaw-Haberman model as an example, fitted the data a lot better than the ordinary Lee Carter model but it doesn't actually have um, <clears throat> particularly good behavior in terms of forecasting. So there isn't an obvious direct trade-off between goodness of fit and uh, forecasting. You can get good fitting models that don't have good forecasting behaviors. You can have models like the Lee Carter one which don't fit the data as well, but actually have quite good and robust um, behaviors in the forecasting. And having an objective criterion like the AIC and the BIC doesn't resolve all of that issue. It doesn't know, um, and in fact, uh, Torsten in my paper from uh, last year, um, it actually it comes directly back to uh, David Wilkie's point about your choice of an ARIMA model. Um, we showed for uh, just within a particular data set, within a particular uh, fitting of the Lee Carter model, there was a variety of different um, ARIMA models that could be fitted. The best fitting model for uh, male data in uh, England and Wales happened to have some uh, additional parameter risk compared to other models because the model was borderline non-stationary. It was just within the, the bounds of being stationary. So although it was clearly the best fitting model in terms of the AIC, um, the other models, uh, the next closest models, were not sufficiently close that you would actually choose them. Nevertheless, it had instabilities that these not quite so good fitting models didn't actually have. So it's, it's a very difficult issue to, to, to manage, and you can often find good fitting models having uh, un, unwelcome properties for forecasting. Which is presumably why you talk a lot about model risk. Which is why we talk a lot about model risk, yes. It's, it's absolutely essential to use lots of different models. And not just variations on a, on a particular flavor, but models that belong to completely different families. Any more? Any, was that a hand? No. Um, David? Shot, you can have yes. a second shot. Could you, could you wait for the, the microphone? Nobody, nobody has their hand up at the moment. Um, I should have said in the very first place, I, I'm very impressed with how mortality forecasting has gone since I was involved with it about 30 years ago with the CMI, which is extremely crude. So this is marvellous. But um, as regards to the last point, uh, I'm going to jump to a different, um, uh, a different example. Where if I take the yields on index-linked bonds for the period where they have been issued, the best fitting AR1 model um, is one with a parameter bigger than one. And that, because they have gone down, they started at 2%, then went up to about 3.5%, and have gone down and down and down to become negative. Well, my first model that was tracking log yield doesn't work, so you've got to go on to just straight yield to allow the negatives. And if you had the best fitting model, then in the long run, the yields on index-linked bonds will become more and more negative until it's in 100 years' time, they were minus 1,000% or something. Well, that's not nonsense. And so I think you have to put on certain, certain constraints on the model if the long-term behavior of them is not sensible. Now, a similar one uh, here, well, I can remember quite a different thing in the old actuarial textbook about population forecasts made in, for England and Wales in the 1930s. At that time, the birth rate had been declining. And they were, it was assumed in one of the projections, and they said, you know, this is artificial, that the, rate, the birth rate would decline linearly until about 1950 it reached zero, and there would be no further births in Britain at all after that date. They did not actually say this is so much rubbish <laughs> that 
What we should be doing, even if it is going down, we should be taking it down not linearly, but exponentially. So the, the whole concept of a linear reduction, uh, the concept of a linear reduction in mortality is nonsense, because after some future year, everybody becomes immortal. That just is implausible. And so there's no point in fitting a totally unreasonable model, even if it fits the data that you've got nicely. So I think you have to think, particularly with the REMA models, or, or any long-term long projection model, you've got to think about what the long-term structure of the model would be. Um, and things can appear to go, go wrong. You may have in the period, um, in the period from, say, 1930 to 1980, inflation was pretty steadily increasing. Your, one of your best forecasts might have been for it to go on increasing forever. You could have a short period, which might you say has happened in Zimbabwe, but it doesn't, it does then stop. Uh, similarly with mortality. If you had a period of increasing mortality, as I think in Russia after 1990, you might make the mistake of forecasting it going up again forever. Instead of saying, you know, this is a, an unfortunate blip and it will come back down again and we'll find a way of at least stabilizing it or possibly reducing it. So it's just a, a general point that you've got to use sense, what are long-term sensible models and not the best fitting ones. And then fit, them, fit the sensible ones as well as you can. Um, if I can answer um, or make a few comments on that. Um, um, that I, I completely agree, of course, you, know, you, you want to look at the projection um, properties of those models. But um, also for, the, for exactly the reason that you just mentioned, that you might get unrealistic um, projections. And so we think that including um, a stochastic term in the projections is so important. And also, as you mentioned earlier, to look at the parameter risk um, um, in the, um, say, in the estimated improvement rates or in the uh, time series parameters or, or whatever those parameters might be. And so we, we, we did that um, and we looked very carefully at um, say the, the risk that comes from the uh, uncertainty about the parameters which we have um, from the uh, past observations, where we estimated those from past observations, and compared those to the uncertainty that we have about future improvements and unexpected improvements in mortality. And uh, we found that there is a, there's a, a balance between those two, so that in the short term the, these kind of future unexpected improvements are more important, but in the long term it isn't exactly the parameter uncertainty um, that becomes so important. That's absolutely right. Yeah. But so, so looking at stochastic models and looking at parameter uncertainty takes some of that problem away from of, of getting very unrealistic projections, because we don't just have one projection, we have many, and we have... Um, uh, we have many scenarios and we have probabilities that we can put on those scenarios. Yeah. Just, just a quick point related to, to what you said about the plausibility of the model. And um, you, you uh, justified not smoothing the, the kappa terms, uh, I think partly in, in response to the way that the unsmoothed kappas looked when you, when you plotted them. Um, is, is there a case for saying, um, even if they don't look particularly smooth when you, when you uh, calculate them, um, it's, it's logical that the kappa terms would be smooth in some way because that's the way mortality works. And therefore you impose a little bit of structure on the kappas just from, from that point of view rather than just staring at the, um, the kappa terms that come out of the model. I think that argument can apply to the alpha and beta terms. Um, it's not clear to me that that would apply to the kappa terms, um, mm -hmm. precisely because they pick up period effects, which I don't think should. Uh, then there's no underlying rationale as to why I think they would be smooth. In the same way that you can understand why the alpha axis should be smooth, because the mortality of a 50-year-old would be higher than a 45-year-old, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, similarly, with uh, the beta axis, you can imagine the rate of improvement can be different or pretty higher at age 60 and 70, but once you get to age 100, the improvement will be lower. So you can understand 
fairly simply why there would be a fairly smooth progression potentially um, from one age to the next and why you would therefore smooth alpha and beta. But I can't think of any rationale as to why the kappa terms in the APCI model should be an underlying smooth process. I agree with that. I, I completely agree with that statement in particular because in the APCI model there is already a very smooth period term which is beta x times y. So there's already this linear improvement in mortality built in by taking beta x times y and estimating the beta x. And um, then on top of that you have a term which captures, so to say, um, unexpected improvements. And to smooth those just seems to be, that seems wrong to me. I think it's the, 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 the very nature of mortality that it cannot be projected with uh, certainty. And it is in the APCI model, I would say, the kappa y is the one term that, um, so to say, makes the model stochastic and that allows for different scenarios to unfold in the future. And therefore, I wouldn't smooth those, those parameters at all. Okay. I'll come back on, on that one, yes. Um, fairly obviously, um, mortality should be fairly smoothed by age, mm. as uh, Stephen says. But there can, there can quite well be <coughs> unexpected upwards movements in mortality. It's very easy for a lot of people to die from infection or catastrophe. It's rather harder to very much downward movements, but 1919 and the flu epidemic there, or any of the years a bit before your period, where there were quite severe flu epidemics in Britain, or in some years when there have been extremely hot summers, on, and so certain countries south of here have had rather high mortality. You can expect the, the rates of the mortality rates from year to year to trickle up and down a lot. That's fairly, fairly normal that they, they change quite a lot. They don't change smoothly. The slow gradual medical improvement, you may say, goes reasonably smoothly. And yet you go back to some quite old CMI, um, well really CMI figures. There was a remarkable drop in mortality in, in the civilian population in Britain in 1942. And after 1942, almost no age reached as high as the um, 41 figures. The same thing is not in the population figures, it's in the assured lives ones. Why it's there, I'm not quite sure. It's a little bit too early for penicillin, but that's a, something like penicillin can produce a step change downwards. But um, something like a tsunami in some places can produce a step change upwards, but only temporarily. Are there any more questions or comments? Okay. Um, well, thank you for the, your contributions. Um, I'd like now to invite Gavin to close the discussion. Uh, Gavin Jones is the Global Head of Longevity Pricing at Swiss Re. He has worked in longevity risk and its transfer since 2003 and co-authored the SIAS paper Financial Aspects of Longevity Risk with Stephen Richards. Thank you, Gavin. So the CMI model, as it's evolved since the uh, introduction of cohort projections, has been first and foremost offers uh, people a transparent means of communication and enabled market participants to express a point of view. And that's been accomplished by having effectively a different process for the historic fit and for the projection, which has been deterministic in nature. I'd welcome the sessional paper where uh, the Edinburgh-based authors focus on the stochastic implementation of the current historic fit process and apply that to projections. And given the huge development over the 25 years since the original Lee Carter model in mortality modeling, particularly over the last decade, that always provides insights, comparisons, and challenges. So any additional model provides one means of summarizing 
a version of understanding and also gaps in that understanding. For example, the material differences that are shown in the paper on the life expectancy between, for example, the APCS and the uh, APCI model, highlighting, as discussed earlier, the prevalence of model risk. That implementation of a stochastic model provides a distribution of outcomes and associated regulatory capital calculations. But as Tim noted, that is not necessarily what the users of the CMI model will apply it for. The projection process requires an approach to identification of parameters, particularly of kappa and gamma, where the authors challenge the identifiability of a signal within that process. That's not a statement that the model's intractable, simply that those parameters with the constraints applied highlight fundamental problems in the fit and forecast of mortality. So in order to apply the model, some level of explicit choice is required from its users. And the published CMI model does provide a simple way for participants to engage in discussions around transaction pricing or funding level of pension schemes. I'd also bring to the audience's attention just recent SOA publication on components of historical mortality improvements, which includes the uh, CMI model as one of the variety of models used to look at US mortality improvements. Underlying the application of stochastic models is the view that there is some form of parameterizable driver which is going to evolve with time. When we work in the context of potential step changes in mortality rates or healthcare provision, it is a reasonable question as to whether that is a good structural description of mortality evolution, and whether a satisfactory calibration can be from a purely mathematical fit, or whether we will need input from outside the model. As a profession, to understand the range of prospective mortality drivers, we can and do look beyond the confines of explicitly modeled risk. It's notable that the recent awards of the Nobel Prize for Economics have included two individuals, Angus Deaton and Richard Thaler, both of whom have been associated with the analysis of mortality risk, albeit from very different directions. Their research addresses problems that would have been familiar to Adam Smith. And for us, as interest rates have fallen over the last two decades, we too have seen mortality in the form of longevity risk return to the centre of our own profession and indeed our shared roots in the Scottish Enlightenment. And with that, I would thank the authors. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. <clears throat> um, it would be very helpful for those preparing the transcript of the discussion for the BAJ if you could hand any prepared notes to the members of the profession's executive at the back of the hall as you leave the meeting. Um, on behalf of all of us, thanks are due to all the authors of the paper, to Stephen for his presentation this evening, to Gavin for closing our discussion, and to all those who have participated in this evening's discussion. To them and to the IFOA staff who made this evening's meeting possible, uh, please express your thanks in the usual way. <laughs>